everyone, and welcome to Book It. I'm Carol Ann Riddell. We are kicking off our new season with some fresh ideas and fun changes that we hope you'll like as much as we do. We've added contributors and segments, and we'll take a deep dive into the business side of books. As always, we'll continue our in-depth conversations with authors. And we begin with Sally Sussman, Chief Corporate Affairs Officer at Pfizer. Her best-selling book, Breaking Through, Communicating to Open Minds, Move Hearts, and Change the World, is an inspiring read about leadership and how pharmaceutical giant Pfizer navigated a massive communications challenge during the pandemic. Sally recently stopped by our studio. Here's that interview. Sally, thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate your taking the time to sit down. Thank you, Carol Ann. Delighted to be here. So your book is Breaking Through, and I have to just say first that I really enjoyed it. It is a fascinating look into what you faced as an executive at Pfizer during the pandemic, but it's also got all of these really candid personal stories in it. In fact, I heard you say that it's been described as a memoir hidden in a business book. Yeah. In fact, before I turned it into my publisher, the Harvard Business Review, I shared my manuscript with a few trusted friends and family. And my mom said to me, Sally, this isn't a business book. <laughs> it's a memoir where you tell all of your mistakes, including the embarrassing ones. But that is what makes it actually so interesting, too. So let's start at the beginning. It is 2020. We are hit with the COVID-19 pandemic. You are the chief corporate affairs officer at Pfizer. And you suddenly face this incredible challenge of coming up with a communications plan at this critical moment in our history. And you basically have to throw out the old playbook. I did, and what a moment it was to be in. I mean, can you just remember back to March of 2020 and the world is shutting down and my boss, the CEO of Pfizer, Albert Borla says, we're gonna make a vaccine in eight months instead of the usual 12 years. And I really started to think, I'm gonna to need to roll this out to a public that is already scared and nervous. And this is not just a product launch. Right. I need to build confidence so that people will take this vaccine because imagine how tragic it would have been to have this great scientific breakthrough that no one was willing to take right. the vaccine. And we should point out, as you do in the book, that Pfizer, Big Pharma generally, was not exactly beloved by the public. No. In fact, you said when you took the job some years prior, some of your friends reacted pretty negatively. So there was that layer as well. Absolutely. I mean, I had worked at two other great companies, American Express and Estee Lauder companies that people love. And I knew when I went to Pfizer that Big Pharma had a poor reputation. And honestly, that's why I went, because I couldn't believe that companies that make life-saving medicine had such lousy reputations. Mm -hmm. And I worked at that for over a decade and banged my head against the wall trying to fix this. And it really wasn't until the pandemic that the moment came when I said, this is my chance. Now I can show the world really, not only what we do, but who we are. So Sally, you're working on this plan and you come to an idea and it is the intent to break through, yes. as the book is called. And I understand there was some yoga in there. <laughs> so tell us about that moment. When you start a yoga practice, you usually set an intention. Mm -hmm maybe something for a loved one or to solve a difficult problem. And before I got into that downward dog, I set an intention too. And I said, I am going to break through and change the reputation of this company and hopefully the industry during this moment of crisis. Wow. And you essentially, what you had to do was create a sense of trust with the yep. public at a time when people were skeptical of vaccines, skeptical of what the government was saying, incredibly politically divided, and as you pointed out before, afraid. Mm -hmm. So what's, I mean, that is a big mission. What is the first step? Well, I think the first step was to hitch our wagon to a brighter star. And the star was the purpose statement of Pfizer, breakthroughs that change patients' lives. And we decided to do some things differently, much more transparency. So we took some of our intellectual property, like a clinical trial protocol, we just put it right up on the website because we couldn't debate these things. We needed to show an open door policy, a, a very transparent way of being. We also made ourselves far more available we had our scientists on television explaining to people, educating, not mm -hmm. selling, 
but educating. And then lastly, the big risk was I embedded media along for the ride. Right. So I had Wall Street Journal reporters. I had a documentary film crew from National Geographic inside the company because I knew if we failed, I'd have bigger problems than a bad news right. day. And if we succeeded, that this would be a story that I would want to tell, that the 85,000 people that work in my company would want to tell, and that we would need to have this footage and this documentation. You know, and we know that trust can be ephemeral, particularly in the court of public opinion. Do you feel it's still a daily challenge in your role? To hold oh, yeah. On? Oh, yeah. You know, trust is earned in drops and lost in buckets. <laughs> Every, well said. Yes. every day you are at risk of losing trust. And it is so hard earned. And today, uh, my company is a top 10 global brand, mm -hmm. according to Fortune Magazine, for the last two years. But now my worry is, how do you keep that trust? Because it is ephemeral and it can be fleeting if you don't continue to earn it every day. So Sally, you say in the book that communication is not a soft skill, it is a rock hard competency. Tell us more about what you mean there. That statement is the central argument of my book. I've worked closely with nine CEOs, with cabinet secretaries, with senators, and Carol Ann, they're all really smart. I mean, you don't get into jobs like sure. that by luck. But the ones that really made a difference, that changed the game, that broke through, those were the ones that put as much attention to their communications as they did to anything else in their company or their campaign. They valued it, they practiced it, they made it a discipline. You outline 10 principles in the book and they are centered around communication, but to my reading, they're really also principles about leadership. Which would you say of the 10, if you had to pick, <laughs> is the most important? Oh, it's a tough question. Um, I, I think I would go with the first one, intentionality. Uh, the one that came to me yeah. in yoga, because I think before every human engagement we have, before every interaction, one should pause and say, what am I really trying to do here? Why am I here? What do I need to bring to this? Yeah. So whether you're talking to elderly parents and you need to be patient, or you're talking to adult children and you need to not be judgmental, or hopefully for your viewers, I can add some insight to their daily lives. Trying to approach each of these interactions with a real intention can make a huge difference. I really agree with you, and yet it is hard to do. It is. It's very hard. So, and then I would have to ask you, of those 10 principles, which would you say is the hardest for you personally? Oh, that's, that is an easy answer because <laughs> I had a struggle with the chapter on humor because humor has become very complicated yes. in our world. People are afraid to say the wrong People thing. don't want to make a joke. They don't want to make a joke. And I almost cut this chapter from the book many times, but I fought with myself to keep it in because I don't want to live in a world without joy, without the ability to be lighthearted together. And so I did write the chapter on humor and it's not about doing stand up or telling a joke. It's about creating a lighter atmosphere. Right you know, being warm and welcoming and joyful. And I think being able to laugh at yourself a little bit, right? Oh yeah, I mean, I like to say we take our jobs seriously, but not ourselves. Exactly. You know, as I mentioned before, you tell such uh, compelling personal anecdotes in the book. One that stuck out to me was when you were a young woman, it's the mid eighties, and you come out to your parents and you say it was not an easy conversation, but then you say in the book, candor is worth it. Absolutely. And I wonder if you could tell us more about how that candor translates for you professionally as well. Sure. And just uh, to tell the story very quickly for your sure. viewers, um, it was the early 80s. It's the heart of the AIDS epidemic. Most gay people were still living in the closet uh, or, you know, on the margins of society. And I went home to St. Louis, Missouri, my Midwestern background, and um, I needed to tell my parents I, that I'm gay. And it was really the toughest conversation I'd ever had in my life. And remember now, it's a long time ago. Sure. Um, things are much better now, but then it was still tough. And I, I just remember my father saying, you know, you won't have a spouse, you won't have a child or a career. And in that moment, those things became my life plan. 
And I'm so fortunate to have, my wife and I are celebrating 35 years next Congratulations. month. Congratulations. 29 year old adult daughter and very happy for the work that I do. But the point is, is that authenticity is what makes relationships work. I now have a great, wonderful, deep relationship with my parents. And so I'm encouraging people to take the risk. If you need to offer an apology, but you're afraid because you hurt someone, do it. If you want to tell someone you love them, but you're afraid of rejection, say it. Because being real and authentic in the workplace helps you in, in so many ways to create the trust that's necessary. It is such a moving section of the book, the conversation with your parents and then subsequently your description of your relationship with them and how they are basically your biggest cheerleaders now, right? Yeah, I think I'm a bestseller because my parents bought all the books. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you also talk interestingly about cancel culture in the book, yeah. and I want to get what you said correctly. You said, when cancel culture fever rises, no one is safe. Tell us what the danger is there in your mind. Well, I was afraid to even write about cancel culture, that, you know, you could... Because of cancel culture. Because of cancel culture. You Correct, could say yeah. something wrong. Um, but then I, I feel it's important to take a stand. And people make mistakes. We all make mistakes. Show me someone who hasn't. But there's a wonderful quote by the civil rights activist, Brian Stevenson, who says, we are not the worst thing that we ever did. Mm. And so... I am really, again, imploring people to be merciful with one another, yeah. be forgiving with one another. Yeah. Show me the person who's not made a mistake. And you talk about your own mistakes in the book, including one early on in your career when you divulged a confidence. And I'm sure it must have been painful to recount, but tell us what that taught you. Absolutely. I, I feel painful even thinking about it because <laughs> it was a, a tough moment for me. I was young in my career my first job out of college, I was working in the mailroom for a United States Senator, and I overheard some big news, that he was planning to announce his retirement. And he and the senior team were thinking about mm -hmm. that. Well, I had a hot piece of news in my pocket, and I was young and naive. I told someone who told someone right. who told someone, and it snowballed. And the next thing you know, the media was knocking on the door of the Senator's oh office. He had to accelerate his announcement. And the source of the leak was quickly drawn back to me. Oh, my gosh. And I was deeply ashamed. I'm sure. I was so embarrassed. I went in and apologized to the senator. But it was never the same mm -hmm. between he and I or for me in that office. Yeah. But as you can see, Carol Ann, to this day, I, I feel this story. I remember it. And I am now a citadel of confidence. <laughs> if you tell me something and you ask me not to tell anyone, I never will. You know, one of the other anecdotes that I related to so much was you talked about being 10 years old and racing out to get on your bike because you were so excited about it. You'd been given for your birthday and your mother stopped you because you had not yet written a thank you note. That was my house. Uh -huh. Our moms would be friends. Uh, so, but I know that you're very intentional about thank you notes still to this day. Yes. As am I why more broadly does that matter to you? In addition to my mom, I <laughs> learned this lesson from Leonard Lauder, who was my boss at the Estee Lauder companies. And when I first started, he was kind to take me around to meet the beauty editors. And one of them was kind of rude to him. And as we were leaving the, the meeting, he said to me, don't forget to write her a thank you note. Hmm. And I was like, really? He said, yep, that's how we roll. And he explained to me that in building his company before they had money for advertising, he would send thank you notes to the women who worked behind the counter or right. the buyers in the big department stores. So I've taken this lesson and made it my own. And every morning I sit at my desk and I look at my calendar from the day before and say, who do I have to thank for yesterday? And I write them a handwritten note. It's usually you know, two or three people. It's not an onerous thing. But it creates such feelings of gratitude and, you know, a sense of good fortune about yeah. our, our life. And people are always really delighted to, to receive them. And it's, it's a great ritual. You know, you have risen so far in corporate America. I know Forbes listed you, I think I'm getting this right, as one of the world's most influential CMOs last year. Congratulations on that. But we know that women, generally speaking, are far behind when it comes to the C-suite. 
What advice do you have for women ascending that, that ladder? Yes, we do have a ways to go. And my advice to women is let's help each other. I have many friends who peer mentor me and I peer mentor them. So they come to me with a question and I stop and I take the time to help them. Or if I know that they've done something well, I'll publicize it on their mm -hmm. behalf. So, you know, sometimes people think, oh, I need the right boss or I need the right mentor. But this idea of peer mentoring and helping each other to stay strong in the job, to find the next opportunity, to believe in ourselves is really very meaningful. Thank you so much for all this time. So you have given us a lot to think about. Really Thank appreciate you. It. Thank, Thank you so much. Now to a new contributor here on Book It. Each month I will be joined by Adrian Cepeda, a bookstore owner, CUNY grad, and podcast host. You might also know Adrian as Book Poppy on TikTok. He'll be bringing us regular author interviews and commentary. So let's introduce you. We caught up with Adrian over the summer as he prepared to open his new bookstore in Queens. So I grew up right there on that second floor for about 10 years. And now? And now? The bookstore, from my view of my window, is right here. Life has come full circle for Adrian Cepeda, from a boy who loved reading to a bookstore owner in the very neighborhood where he grew up. It just means so much because we haven't had a bookstore here. We never had a bookstore here. And not just any bookstore, this space is dedicated to BIPOC books exclusively, Black, Indigenous, and people of color. This specific space is only for BIPOC authors because one of the biggest issues is not only publishing BIPOC authors, but it's promoting, celebrating these authors. Even when he's not at his bookstore, Adrian is talking books to his tens of thousands of followers on TikTok, where he's known as Book Poppy. And he hosts a podcast, which he's now bringing to us at CUNY TV. I'm so excited. I love it. It's exciting. It's, I'm glad to be back from CUNY. And we are so glad to have you, Adrian, right here in our studio. Welcome. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. I know. We're going to have a lot of fun. Yes, we are. Absolutely. So, Adrian, it's very clear how passionate you are about promoting diversity in books. Yes. But tell us how you started on that path. I was in college. It was my senior year, and it was the first time I read a book. Um, it was by Juan o Diaz, The Wonders Life of Oscar Wilde. And it was the first time I saw a little Latino boy speaking Spanglish. Um, being chunky, which I was chunky when I was younger, <laughs> um, reading comic books, which I love reading comic books. And it was the first time I was reflected, and I was like, why is this the first time I see somebody speaking like me and acting like me mm -hmm. in books? And after that, I just went full throttle on just reading BIPOC books, especially Latina books. But then that became actually a career choice for you as well. Yes, yeah, yeah. So um, my daughter was born. I said, how can I avoid this from happening to her? Yeah. It shouldn't it shouldn't take 20 years for her to re see herself in a book or in media or anything. So my first one was to write a book and then I was like, "Ah, eh, I mean this takes too long." So then I was like, "Let me try to open a bookstore." <laughs> so she can actually go in with her friends and actually experience books that reflect their cultures. But let's dig into that a little bit more, Adrian. When we talk about representation in books, how critical is that particularly for kids? Yeah, so one on the one end, it, it if it's your culture and your um, identity, it gives you a place so you don't feel alone. If you're reading books about other cultures, it gives you empathy. You get to learn more about mm -hmm. the people around you, the people you grow up with, the people that you see every single day. Um, yeah, so that's what it really does for you. So Adrian, uh, starting with our next episode, you are gonna be bringing us regular author interviews. Super excited about that. Just give us a sense of the kinds of things we're gonna be seeing from you over the next few months. Again, my focus is BIPOC authors, a lot of BIPOC authors, and then we're gonna see creators also. So I'm gonna invite creators who aren't necessarily in the book talk or book scene, but who are going through their own reading journey. Because okay. it's important to speak to non-readers who are becoming readers. So you mentioned TikTok, book talk, where you are known as Book Poppy. Yes. Tell us about it. Yes, yes, so that started during the pandemic. It's hard to talk about books to people if you can't be near them. Um, so I decided to use TikTok. I started recommending books and just kept doing it and doing it and doing it. I got a great following, great community. I became a TikTok Latinx creator. It's been a wonderful way to not only bring my knowledge of all these BIPOC books to everywhere nationwide, but it's been great for the bookstore too. 
All right, well, Adrian, thank you for coming in. Welcome to Book It. We are so excited to have you. And like I said, we're definitely gonna have some fun together. Yes, we are. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to bring you and everyone else, all these authors, and give them a space to talk about it. Here on Book It, we love to hear how accomplished professionals in the literary world got their start. So we're launching a segment called How I Did It. Here's the first installment. Hi, I'm Kate White, the New York Times bestselling author of 23 books, including 18 mysteries and thrillers. The latest, an Apple Best Book of the Month, is Between Two Strangers. Before I became a full-time author, I was the editor-in-chief of Cosmopolitan Magazine. Here's how I did it. Though I loved my career in the magazine business, I secretly wanted to write suspense fiction and I wanted to do it before it was too late. I started writing at night uh, after my kids and husband went to bed because I'm a night owl, but I found that my brain just didn't write fiction at night. So that meant I had to do it in the morning. I'd take my kids to school, and then I'd write one page every day before my staff got in at Cosmo. Uh, they were young and they got in late. And then on weekends, I'd write two pages or three pages before my kids got up. And after about a year or so, I had a full-time book. The biggest hurdle for me was conquering an urge to procrastinate. I, I just had had it my whole life. And I did it by using a technique from a guy named Edwin Bliss, a time management expert, called slice the salami. And his technique is thin slice it to a point where it's more appetizing for you. So that's what I did. I thought about it and I realized, you know, I think I could write 15 minutes a day. So that's what I did. I set a timer and I wrote for 15 minutes a day for the first six months. And over time, I began to expand that. I wrote eight books while I was at Cosmo. So if you've got a goal that you're dying to fulfill, try slicing the salami. That's how I did it. Now to another new edition here on Book It. We are calling it The Fine Print, a regular segment on the business side of books. And we are joined today by an expert in that area, Jim Milliot, the editorial director at Publishers Weekly. Jim, thanks so much for coming in. Yeah, great to be here. Glad to have you. So Publishers Weekly is described as the Bible of the book business. So let's start with the health of the industry. What's it looking like right now? Where are sales? Uh, well, sales are, are trending down this year compared to last year, 2022. But, you know, the pandemic, like it did for a lot of under indus other industries, has kind of screwed up what was for traditional business models and traditional sure. sales trends. So in 2020, to the surprise of almost everybody in the industry, sales went up from 2019. People were reading a lot during the pandemic. People were definitely reading a lot during the pandemic. And what are you seeing, Jim, in terms of print books versus e-books? I mean, I know that everyone said at one time, like, oh, print books are going to be dinosaurs, but that hasn't really happened, has it? Oh, no. That, uh, you know, you know, what was it, 2010, 2011, when, when the Kindle came along and all that sort of stuff, it was a lot of doom and gloom for what sure. does this mean? And bookstores in particular, they'll never need to go to a bookstore. They'll just never order everything online. But and people was, like to hold a book, right? Yeah, there was a big spike and then flat. So Jim, would you say that e-books and paper books are about equal in terms of sale or is, or is there a difference? There's two things to consider. Print is probably like 80% overall, but that other portion is made up by e-books, but also audio. Right. Digital audio has been huge. We have to touch on artificial intelligence. What are the industry insiders saying about how AI might impact publishing? What they're saying is we really have to keep an eye on it. They're all very keenly aware of it. Uh, somewhere between panics and this is the best new thing that's ever happened to us. I saw it sounds like kind of the reaction a lot of people are having. The Authors Guilds has issued a whole new, new um, model contract that they suggest for their authors. Uh. Four clauses in there about these are the things that you have to guard against for AI. Wow, you know, interesting. And most of it is, of course, copyright protection. Um, as somebody was quoted as saying, you know, the big winners here will be the cop copyright lawyers. That's probably right. going to be true. So there's a great 
deal of concern about you know how it's going to play out and then with the publishers themselves um, you know how are they going to use it could they have chat GPT write marketing copy instead sure, of other sure. people a final very quick question for you Jim any big predictions for the year ahead in publishing well you know people are definitely going to try to uh, try to get to this new normal is I mean there have been layoffs through the in the industry um, people are trying to grapple exactly where sales are going to land I mean right now they're down about three or four percent, which isn't the end of the world. So I think it's going to be a lot of belt tightening between now and, and 2024. Um, but for an industry that's sort of used to up and downs, if they finish the year up over 2019, which again is the yardstick, everybody measures things by still, Yeah. Uh, they'll be happy. All right, good. Very interesting stuff. Thank you so much, Jim. Appreciate your coming by. Yeah, sure. Next, we head over to Linda Stacy and Uncensored. As always, Linda has plenty to say about what she's reading. An American Beauty by Shanna Abe is the based on truth story of Arabella Huntington, once the richest woman in America. Feminists like to say she was a self-made woman of the Gilded Age, but she was self-made in as much as she married well for a living. The novel paints her as a woman who worked serving champagne in a gambling house where she met Collis Huntington, a married bazillionaire railroad tycoon. In Abe's telling, Arabella and Collis fell madly in love and she became a kept woman who had his baby, a boy named Archer. His long-suffering, vengeful wife, meantime, never produced the much-coveted male heir. Biographical information suggests that Archer wasn't even Huntington's son at all, but the son of a different married man. In this fictionalized story, Arabella is an independent woman racking up the bucks through wise investments seeded by her lover Huntington. But biographies also suggest instead that she cared for his ailing wife and married Collis when the wife died. Either way, she did rack up the big bucks through very brilliant land investments. After Collis died, Arabella married her dead husband's nephew, another railroad tycoon. She, however, went on to become one of the great philanthropists and art collectors. At the end of the read, unfortunately, I was left not really caring about anybody involved. On the other hand, Lessons in Chemistry by Bonnie Garmus is far and away the best novel I've read all year. Garmus is both hilarious and brilliant writer who gives us characters that you not only love, but really care about. This is not an easy trick when you write a book that makes readers laugh out loud. The book is about a female chemist in the 1960s. She's demeaned and dismissed and her work was stolen by male colleagues. Even so, she and a dorky but great male chemist fall madly in love. He believes in her and in her work. Unfortunately, he meets his untimely end in an accident and she's left to raise a child alone. She takes up rowing and somehow ends up as a famous TV chef who teaches cooking via chemistry. I know, this doesn't sound laugh out loud funny, but trust me, it is. It takes a hell of a writer to make you laugh and cry at the same time. Garmus does it and seems to do it with ease. Please buy this book. It may make you rethink cooking or maybe even take up rowing. I love this book. For Uncensored, I'm Linda Stacy. That wraps up this first chapter of our all new Book It. Thanks so much for joining us. A quick reminder to check us out on social media. We'd love to hear from you. I'm Carol Ann Riddell. See you next time on Book It.